Congratulations to everyone. Thank you. Great seeing you and my friend Rosa. And I'm going to ask you to stay. To stay on stage for the conversation, for my favorite part of the event, I'm going to ask Peggy and Saro to join. Um, Peggy is going to lead us to the conversation, and she's going to show us the mastery, in my opinion, of how to build trust. Because trust requires honesty and vulnerability and showing up in our truth. And just sit back and watch the magic of conversations. Thank you again, Zainab, so much. And congratulations to the GSN, to its founders, and to Raza. So what always happens here is that the table conversations and the cocktail conversations lead to insights and questions and curiosity that have nothing to do with the questions that I was scripted with ahead of time. And in this case, it occurred to me that it would be really interesting to hear from both of you because I think stories and examples are what really convey inspiration and modeling that we can all learn from. That we ought to focus on three things. One, what happened inside each of you to get you to the point that you had the trust in yourself and the confidence and you found the passion to take the road that you took, both to really direct your energy to accomplish some huge thing that we both know what it is and we'll talk about it more. And not only to, to build that within yourself, but then to decide not only to do it, not to do it in a confrontational way alone, although sometimes confrontation is needed, but what was it inside you? What happened in your lives? that allowed you to keep your credibility with your constituency, which is a very important thing for a bridging leader, at the same time as you're willing to reach out across the divides to those who actually might be causing part of the problem. So I'm gonna start with you, Sarah, with that question, and then move to Raza. All right, well, um, you know, uh, this work that I'm doing for the last 17 years came out of trauma and tragedy. It was, as you mentioned, 9-11 was the source of uh, this organization. I was asked as a very young organizer and attorney right after 9-11 to start an organization with the surviving workers uh, from Windows on the World. I don't know how many of you had ever eaten at Windows on the World. It was the restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center, Tower One, on the 107th and 108th floor. Uh, it was above the clouds and above where the plane hit that morning. The owner of Windows had wanted somebody from every island nation, every nation on earth working in the restaurant so that anybody who came into the restaurant would have somebody to speak their language and sell them $10,000 bottles of wine. <laughs> um, so it was the most incredibly uniquely diverse uh, group of people you've ever met in your life, uh, intentionally so. And they went through this incredible trauma together of losing 73 sisters and brothers in the restaurant that day who either jumped to their deaths or were evaporated inside the restaurant because the plane hit below them and the heat rose so quickly, they were literally evaporated. Uh, and they went through this incredible trauma that I was a p privy to, part of, in the days after 9-11, getting back on their feet, uh, finding jobs, and starting an organization that would initially be about them and then started to be about the whole industry, all workers and then employers. And um, somebody wrote a book about, a woman named Rinku Sen wrote a book about our trajectory. And um, she called, she kind of watched how we just naturally, because of our work, just, be, just opened our arms wider and wider and wider and wider. We started with a group of immigrant workers who were displaced from windows on the world. We grew to include U.S. born workers, that grew to include employers who, who wanted to be part of the network. It grew to include consumers who wanted to be part of the network, and then everybody. And um, it, we just, we, we realized that's what we had to do to, um, to win. And there was, a, I would say, one defining moment, I will, just, in terms of stories. Um, we had been doing this work for a long time, you know, working to advance workers' rights, but still a lot of resistance from the industry. 
In 2015 or 2016, the president of the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker, sat me down with a man named Danny Meyer. Some of you may know who Danny Meyer is. He's one of the most prolific restaurant owners in the United States, ha owns a lot of the restaurants uh, in, in you know, midtown Manhattan. Most legendary fine dining restaurant owner. We sat down for the first time uh, after you know, 12 or 13 years of doing this work. I told him the story that I told you earlier, the history of the, the slavery in the, tip, in the tip minimum wage, the sexual harassment. Um, and he said, I've hated this system for 20 years and you've given me an impetus to change it and invited me to come present to all of his managers in upstate New York. And the general manager of the modern restaurant at the MoMA was there and said, I want to make, I want to do something different. And then we worked with that company over like a, a year period to kind of transition to a different model. They have moved transition to a gratuity free model. And given his legendary status in the industry, we counted three or 400 restaurants following his lead after that. And, um, and later he told the New York Times, you know, it used to be that when I heard Saru's name, I'd go running in the opposite direction. <laughs> I was afraid of her because she was seen as the troublemaker. But when we finally sat down uh, and he heard what I had to say and he said, actually, what you're saying is something I believe in, um, it, it ended up making a bridge not just between him and me, but a much wider world of companies that, you know, now, as I said, we're at 700. So I, I just feel like there are these moments, in terms of like for me, what brought me to that place, it was, it was natural because we, when you come out of trauma, <laughs> you, you're hard, you, you need everybody, <laughs> you need everybody, and that's really where it came from. Yeah. Thank you, that's an amazing example. Reza, I know a little bit more about your story, but I'm not going to tell it. You are. So please give us a sense of where, where you came from the time you let, left Quetta, Pakistan, to where you are now. What was your personal journey in coming to commit yourself to such a, such a passionate cause of ending slavery and promoting equitable employment for all? So I think I'm getting more credit than due. So, I must tell you, <laughs> it is not uh, myself alone on this uh, subject that started off. I started off with sort of caring, and I wouldn't even call it philanthropy because my total capital was $200. So, I, uh, since the age of 18, I didn't have much to give, so I would give blood to a foundation called Fatmeet Foundation for those of you who are here from Pakistan. Uh, over there, stand in line, give blood, anybody can... It's the, I think giving is an attitude and not a privilege. And if we start appreciating that, I think uh, we, we can really do a lot more. So that's how I felt. I supported a lot of organizations, including a burns unit in a hospital, kidney center, uh, and many other uh, organizations. And I would find people doing great stuff and I would go behind the scenes and try and support them and see what I could do. Um, because I had very little knowledge and experience at the age of 18, I thought that the Blood Foundation needs support from the government, so we should talk to the president, as an 18 year old would think, so I called the president. He didn't answer. Didn't answer for weeks and weeks. I was very upset, so I was very angry. I left very angry messages till we got a call and uh, I was asked to submit the details and he saw us. And I took the delegation and we asked in three minutes what we wanted and we got. So I really thought everybody, you can just approach, be honest, be transparent, and if your cause is straightforward and not uh, self-promoting, you will get your way. I still believe it. So that's how I started. What brought about substantial change was as I was expanding and learning how to do business, I realized I really don't know much, much of business because I did different businesses. I started a bank and aviation and insurance and real estate sort of things. But I didn't, I didn't know any of those businesses. So what I would do, I would go partner with somebody who knows the business and I would bring what I can on the table and work with them. And that's how I built different businesses. But I wasn't doing that for my philanthropy. That's how I could scale up my business. I was trying to do things on my own. And 
honestly, my real first interaction with an organization, international organization that I'd respect for, was Synergos. And it was, I think, yesterday we were trying to calculate. It was about, or day before we were calculating. It's about probably between 12, 13 years ago. I came to university for a night. And a uh, very dear friend now, Bob Dunn, who is there someplace, or maybe he had to leave early for a concert, yeah. So, uh, so that's how my journey started. And I learned a lot from the organization, the members of the organizations. Uh, this jacket that I'm wearing is uh, about 10 years ago, one of the members, Michael Sonnenfeld, who's not here right now, I told him, wow, you're wearing an amazing jacket. He got this made for me, so that's why I made sure that I wear it today. <laughs> so that's how I started. I learned from Synergos, and as I went along, I think the journey to Montana really helped me, and that I'll leave at suspense. Try to find out what happened at Montana. <laughs> no, I think we'll keep that a secret. No, not really. So let's jump for a minute to impact, because my experience and hearing stories of other people here is we need to do the inner work. We need to strengthen our resolve. And then we need to bridge. But our objective is to really have an impact in terms of what you're doing. So we know a bit about GSN. I'll start with you, Reza, and how you were able to bring the world religious leaders together to declare against slavery. But can you tell us, because there are many members here tonight, some of the impacts on the ground that have happened? Because I know each person is really working in their own area around this. And can you give us an example or two? Okay. So GSN is no individuals. It is just all of us. And all of us are playing a very important role every day. So I give you an example. So I, again, I will just telling what GSN does, but what I did not mention is it is across different sectors, the faith, the governments, businesses, media, and the nonprofits coming together and working together. We want to add academia to it now. Example of a GSN uh, sort of an impact last year around this time, uh, one of our members, Vineet Mera spoke to Patrick, another member, about facial recognition that was being adopted by Emirates Airline at Dubai airports for customer service or improved customer service security. But uh, uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was that that gave them the idea, let's go to uh, use that for something more useful related to human trafficking. They, talk to the company called Vision Box, it's a Portuguese company, that if they could somehow use this facial recognition for recovering missing children in India. Vision Box helped. Then we contacted another member, and I think we have a couple of uh, members uh, from Kailash Satyarthi's foundation here. I saw Anjali and Andre here both. So Kailash Satyarthi was also a very dear friend, and he is a Nobel Peace Prize winner alongside Malala. So his foundation, having been licensed on the ground, and Bhuvan, his son, who's very active and a lawyer by profession, again got engaged in groundwork on how to use this uh, software and uh, contacted the police. Now all these connections, all these bridging happen because Everybody went with an attitude to serve. And in the end, in a space, in just short time of four days, we recovered 3,000 children. So 3,000 children in New Delhi were recovered in four days. This is just one of the many examples. No, that's a great example. And we know about your membership and the the alliances that you're starting to create with um, certain restaurant owners to improve the livelihoods of, of um, restaurant workers. Can you talk also a little bit about the impact that you either have already had or intend to have further around public policy? 
Yeah, we've, uh, we've passed uh, bills at the local, state, and federal level uh, that have impacted millions of workers. Um, so last year, we passed a bill in Congress that protects TIPS as the property of workers because there was an attempt by the current administration to make TIPS the property of owners rather than workers. Um, so that impacted 14 million workers nationally. Uh, the, the government estimate was in the billions of dollars of workers uh, that were able to keep their money. Um, but in many, many states, I would say in at least 15 or 20 states, we've raised workers' wages. Here in New York, we raised workers' wages from three to $10 an hour, so a 300% increase for about uh, 850,000 workers. Um, and then we've done that in multiple other states, in California, uh, in Illinois, and all over the country, really. So I would say in total, we've probably uh, raised wages for five or six million workers, um, anywhere from you know, 50 to 300% increase in wages. But maybe even more importantly, we've documented the impact on business as well. And we've shown, we've actually documented how much employee turnover costs restaurants. We've actually quantified how much employee turnover costs restaurants. The restaurant industry in the United States has the highest rates of employee turnover of any business. We've quantified how much it costs businesses. It's in the millions of dollars. And we've shown that businesses can cut their employee turnover in half by paying people better wages and providing them with better mobility. So we've, we've not only increased wages for at least five or six million workers in the United States, We've also you know, introduced incredible savings, productivity, longevity, and sustainability for hundreds of thousands of businesses. Yes. So we're running out of time, unfortunately, but I want to raise a commonality that I think the two of you have, which is around employment and workers' rights and bringing people out of slavery or virtual slavery. Um, and this morning we heard a presentation about some work that Synergos was involved to try to understand the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the textile industry and the, and the digitization of salaries and the way that an agreement was reached among the various constituencies um, that would in effect increase the wages of, of workers. I'm wondering, having heard from each other, if you have any observations that would be helpful to the other or ways in which your two organizations in some way could work together in the future. So I'm turning it over to you. Thanks. She's already a member of GSN, she doesn't know it yet. <laughs> She's focused on goal eight, which is 8.5 and 8.6 and 8.8, .8, decent work for all, human rights, actually labor right. So she's absolutely focused on goal 8.5, 8.6, and 8.8. .8. So you're a member of GSN. So we already have a lot of commonalities. Thanks. I think, I, <laughs> and thanks for introducing us. So now we have one more force on it. Now, uh, like you're working on uh, this amazing uh, idea of how to get rights for the people in food industry or restaurant industry. I think there's a problem all over the world. And I think when we work together and go learn from what you have experienced, uh, I think we can do a lot more. We've got Ron Bruder here who runs, who started Education for Employment. And uh, that organization is helping us look at creating jobs worldwide. So all of you who are working on Goal 8, I think it's good to work together and take these models and scale them up. Example of textile industry, I was just thinking, and if, I would love for all of you to please weigh in on it and help us and support us, that if we start, like whenever you buy any food item, you would find ingredients on it, right? We all are very conscious of the calories, the sodium, etc. But when we buy garments, whether it's denim jeans or shirt or t-shirt or anything, if we start asking for the labor cost of each item, I think this is something a buyer should know, that if a $200 jean had only 40 cents labor cost, we have the right to know. So we want to see which organization pays better. And ideas like these. 
That's awesome. I'm very honored to join. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think the idea of modern day slavery, uh, we can really extend because as I've mentioned, the idea of a $2 wage in the United States in 2019 is an actual legacy of American slavery. It is an actual legacy of historic slavery in the United States. But frankly, $2 in the United States in 2019 is slavery because, you know, if you think about it, uh, any employer who says, I shouldn't have to pay my own workers, you the customers should pay my workers' wages for me th in the form of tips, uh, any, other, any other context in which an employer is essentially saying, I'm not going to pay for my workers' value, that is what slavery is. And so I just think extending the notion of modern day slavery to, um, to even the industrialized world where the remnants of slavery exist, not just in my work, but in the prison industrial complex, uh, in indentured, uh, in the ways in which prisoners are made to work for pennies on the dollar in the United States. There's a whole extension of what you're talking about uh, in the United States that it would be great to, to include. And then the other thing that I, I really wanna lift up because I know we're out of time and I feel like, I think we all, We've heard a lot of talk today about the turbulent times and the divisive times and why we need trust. And it's just so imperative that we all understand that what we are talking about is not out there. It's not saving those people. It's not a missionary activity of uplifting modern day you know, slaves or raising workers' wages. If if we actually care for ourselves about democracy, about our climate, about the future of our world, what I hope we understand, at least in the United States, and I think we're seeing this globally, is that if we don't actually do something to uplift the millions and millions of people in this country and abroad who are struggling to put food on their own tables and thus not able to engage civically, politically, to vote, to actually worry about the climate or to uh, think about, how, you know, my brother is my, my brother is my brother rather than engaging in a, in a tactic of fear and division. That fear and division arises from deep suffering. <laughs> Fear and division arises from deep suffering, and people in this country are suffering, people abroad are suffering, and so thinking about these issues is not a missionary activity. It is how we save ourselves. And that about sums it up. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This has been an incredible evening.